kind of sparse this morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Trinity Services, and we're pleased that you made it in, in spite of the weather. And uh, if you're a visitor, we're particularly pleased to have you with us this morning. And I would ask that you look at your bulletin and tear off this little sheet here and uh, register your attendance with us, because we would like to meet you and, and to have you come back and be a part of this fellowship, if you would like. Reverend Betsy, as you can see, isn't here this morning. She's taking uh, uh, this weekend off. She has spent the last uh, two or three days at uh, Subiaco in reading and planning and prayer. And she asked that we ask you to pray for her as she seeks discernment and God's direction. And she, of course, will be back, be back on the job tomorrow, be in the pulpit next week. And now we'll continue with our worship. you to stand and join with me in our opening prayer and remain standing for our processional hymn. God, we feel a strong immortal hope 
which bears our mournful spirits up beneath their mountain loads. Redeemed from death and grief and pain, we soon shall find our friends again within the arms of God. Amen.
come right on up here, boys and girls. Here, let's do some offering right here. Sophia, you want to put those? Everybody, anyone else have offering? Want to put in right in here? There we go. Thank you. Look at all those Trinity Kid envelopes. That's so good to see all those. Anyone else want to put one? Let me come right in here. Sit right down here, okay? Here, read this with me. Read that, okay? Let's right behind me. Come over here. Come on over here. <laughs> All is well. That is so good. That is so true. You know, this song that we were just blessed with from our handbell choir is sometimes a song that we sing maybe at sad occasions. And sometimes, you all, some sad things happen in our lives. And maybe you lose a pet or maybe you lose a grandparent or, or, or someone more close to your family. And it's a real sad time. But like our scripture says, in the very end, all is well. That's right, let's take a look at this picture right here. And it says, behold, I bring you good news. What is this right here? Can you tell what that is right there? What's that a picture of? You know that, Jack? Uh -huh. It looks like a bird, kind of like a bird because it has wings on it. Can you tell what that is, maybe? It's an angel. It's an angel. And you know, in all of our Bible stories, it seems like there's always an angel that comes and says, do not be afraid. And that's something really important to know. That the angel, the good news that Jesus brings us, the good news that God brings us and the angels, it all says, do not be afraid. So when there are bad times, and remember, boys and girls, that God does not cause these bad times to happen, but he's part of that good news that when they do happen, he's going to be there for us. He's part of that good news to be there for us, okay? So let's always remember that. When the bad things happen, the angels who said, do not be afraid, the good news is that God is always right there with us. And I want to share this picture too. Look at this. Who is this right here? It's y'all. It's y'all during Christmas time. And you all were sharing some good news that day because you were blessing us with your music. And that's part of that good news that Jesus wants us to know. So let's remember that during the week and during always, that God is always with us, okay? And he brings the good news. So congregation, if you can help us, if we can put our hands all together, and let's make prayer hands. Everybody making prayer hands? And let's pray together. Dear God, you are with us when we are happy. Be with us also when we are sad. You are the good news, God. All is well. Amen. So before we go to worship arts now, for those that are going with us, if you want to pick up scripture cards right here from both sides, Sean's on this side and here's a basket over here, okay? As the children are leaving and we are going into our time for morning prayer, I hope that you have taken your worship bulletin and noticed the individuals who are named there who need our prayers. Take your bulletins home and remember these people during the week. Now let us pray. Our Father God, we come to you experiencing a cold winter. The days are short, the trees are bare, we have to wear sweaters and heavy coats just to keep warm. So often, recently, we go for days without even seeing the sun. Some may describe these days as dark and gloomy, but every once in a while, Father, we see a faint glimpse of spring, a robin on a branch here and there, 
or even in spite of the freezing temperatures, there are jonquils that are poking up every so slightly through the sleet and snow. Father, we're thankful for hymn writers such as Natalie Sleeth, who lift our spirits when she affirms, in the cold and snow of winter, there's a spring that waits to be, unrevealed until its season, something you, God, alone can see. In our worship today, Father, help us to realize that often there are times in our lives when we feel sad, gloomy, maybe even depressed because of things that life's journeys bring our way. We pray for insight, wisdom, and the comfort that only you can bring. These days can soon pass and that we are able to cope and hold on to the promise that there is a better day ahead. We left Reverend Betsy in our prayers today. Our wish for her is that there are in these few days away that she becomes strengthened in spirit and returns with new zeal to serve you and as she ministers to us here at Trinity. We pray for our church and pray for the time that we spend in exploring our mission and charting our direction for the future. We give thanks for the ministry of Nick and many other volunteers as they lead these sessions. We pray that as a congregation that we are able to frame a vision that meets the needs of our membership, those who are hurting, programs for our children and youth, and that we are able to continue to provide outstanding educational programming for all of our members. As we are equipped to do your will, may we be instruments of your witness into our community and beyond. Our prayer is that those who feel that they, that they are in the cold of winter, that they can somehow sense your present loving warmth. May they somehow, through your touch, believe that spring is just ahead. These things we ask in the name of our Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes from 2 Samuel 18, 24 through 33. Now David was sitting between the two gates. The watchman on duty went up on the roof of the gate by the wall. He looked out and saw a man running alone. The watchman called out and reported this to the king. The king said, if he's alone, it's good news. The man got nearer and nearer, and the watchman saw another man running and called down to the gatekeeper. There's another man running alone. The king said, that one must be bringing good news too. The watchman said, I can see that the first one runs like Zadok's son, Achimatz. He's a good man, the king said, and is coming with good news. Achimatz called out to the king, peace, then bowed low before the king, his nose to the ground. He said, bless the Lord your God, who has delivered up the men who raised their hands against my master, the king. The king said, is my boy Absalom okay? Achimot said, I saw a large crowd right when Joab, the king's servant, sent your servant off, but I don't know what it was about. Step aside and stand here, the king said. So Achimot stepped aside and waited. Then the Cushite arrived and said, My master, the king, listen to this good news. The Lord has vindicated you this day against the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, Is my boy Absalom okay? The Cushite answered, May the enemies of my master the king and all who rise up against you to hurt you end up like that young man. The king trembled. He went up to the room over the gate and cried. As he went, he said, Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, my son. My son, Absalom. If only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom. My son. My son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As most of you know by now, Reverend Betsy's current sermon series has been titled, Jesus the Healer, Still Caring for the Mentally Distressed. Several issues have been addressed, including depression, oppression, addiction, and suicide. Today we end this series with my sermon on grief. Now you know, when we talk about the subject of grief, there are really some very, very difficult situations in the world Just the other day, I ran across this story in the newspaper. Perhaps you saw it because it was quite distressing. It seems a couple was going on vacation, but the wife was on a business trip, so she wouldn't be able to arrive until the next day. When the husband arrived at the hotel in South Florida, he decided to send his wife a quick email. The only problem was, he mistyped a letter in the email address, and instead of it going to his wife, it went to an elderly preacher's wife whose husband had passed away only the day before. When the grieving widow checked her email, she let out a scream and fell to the floor in a dead faint. And at the sound, her family rushed into the room, and this is what they saw on the monitor. Dearest wife, Just got checked in. Everything prepared for your arrival tomorrow. P.S. Sure is hot down here. (laughs) 
But you know, uh, contrary to that uh, story, there are not too many grief stories I'm aware of that are funny. We all seem to have grief stories. And I will say to you now that my personal grief story is certainly not the only one that is important. It is important to my wife and to me, and it's had a major influence in shaping our lives. But what we must understand is that grief is an individual experience, and each person's experience may be just as real and shattering to them as mine was to me. Many years ago, I heard a story about a man who was always complaining and feeling sorry for himself about the griefs that he had suffered in his life. So it happened one day that he was invited to a large gathering of people, all of whom had had grief in their life. And uh, towards the end of the meeting, the leader of the meeting asked everyone to write on a piece of paper what their particular grief was and then to bring that piece of paper to the front or to the front of the room to lay it on the floor so that everyone could walk around and see the different griefs and select the one that they would like to have. So everyone did that and the, the man who was always complaining looked and looked and looked and finally he selected one. It was his own and everyone else selected their own grief as well. You know, although we usually associate grief with a person's death, it's important to understand that the death of a person is not the only grief experience that we may encounter. Divorce can be devastating and can feel like death to the persons involved. The loss of a family pet can cause very real grief within the family. And the loss of a job can be so devastating it can almost break one's spirit. The point is that what may not seem grievous to us may be a truly grieving experience for someone else. That is to say we cannot judge another's grief experience through our own lens of experience. Each of us has our own unique and individual experience. Reverend Trevor Hudson is a pastor from South Africa whom I had the privilege of hearing a few years back uh, during the rainy preaching series at, at uh, Pulaski Heights United Methodist. He's written several books, one of which is titled Listening to the Groans. And in this little book he tells of having coffee with a pastor friend of his at the airport just before Reverend Hudson was to return to South Africa. As they sat there uh, visiting with each other, Reverend Hudson looked at his friend and said, if you could say one thing to me, what would it be? The pastor thought for a moment and replied, when you go back to South Africa and stand up to preach and teach, remember always that each person sits next to their own pool of tears. And I have found that this is so true. And as Reverend Hudson says, each of us carries in our hearts our own personal wounds. And so the opportunity is there for each of us as Christian people to minister to that person with their own pool of tears. In fact, I believe it is a calling to which we are privileged to respond. In our own church, your congregational care ministers are perfect examples. These are people who love and care enough that they even go through training in how to effectively minister to someone who is grieving. Now probably the most important thing we as congregational care ministers learn is not what to say, but what not to say, such as, God must have needed another angel in heaven. I can't imagine whoever came up with this dumb remark, but it is certainly not helpful. In fact, it's tremendously insensitive. Or, I understand how you feel. No, 
We do not understand how the person feels because it's not happening to us. It's happening to them. And there's no way we can truly understand how they feel. So let's don't try to walk in their shoes. Let's just try to walk beside them. Also, time heals all wounds. No, not the emotional wound of losing a loved one. The wound never heals, but with time we adjust to the pain. As Anne Lamont says in her book, Traveling Mercies, all those years I fell for the great palace lie that grief should be gotten over as quickly as possible and as privately. But what I've discovered since is that the lifelong fear of grief keeps us in a barren, isolated place and that only grieving can heal grief. The passage of time will lessen the acuteness, but time alone, without the direct experience of grief, will not heal it. I'm pretty sure that it is only by experiencing that ocean of sadness in a naked and immediate way that we come to be healed, which is to say that we come to experience life with a real sense of presence and spaciousness and peace. And I think one of the most unhelpful remarks is, it is the will of God. If you've said this, please think about what you're saying. And don't say it again before you've read Dr. Leslie Weatherhead's book titled, The Will of God. Once you've read this book, I think you'll understand that such a remark is not only insensitive, it's wrong-headed. Saying it's the will of God might make you feel better, but I assure you it does not make the suffering person feel better. Dr. Weatherhead was the pastor of City Temple Church in London during World War II, and he had to minister to people who were daily losing their homes and their loved ones to the bombing by the Nazis. One of his first stories in that book is that of a good friend whose wife had recently died. When she was dead, his friend said, well, I must accept it. It is the will of God. Dr. Weatherhead goes on to write, the friend was a doctor and for weeks he had been fighting for her life. He had called in the best specialist and had used all the devices of modern science and all the inventive apparatus by which the energies of nature can be used to fight disease. So was he all that time fighting against the will of God? If she had recovered, would he not have called her recovery the will of God? Yet surely we cannot have it both ways. The woman's recovery and the woman's death cannot equally be the will of God. Friends, God's will is not to cause pain or death. God's will is to give comfort and strength and to walk with us through the darkness. But we may ask, well, what can we do when someone loses a loved one or encounters great adversity? Let me suggest some things. First. If you can't say anything other than the remarks or platitudes like I've mentioned earlier, then don't say anything. Just touch them and be in their presence. When Paula and I lost our little boy at the age of four, several wonderful friends came to the hospital. And I have to say, while their comments were made with the best of loving intentions, they were often not very helpful. And actually, the most helpful to me was my brother-in-law, Bud, who said nothing. He simply walked over with tears in his eyes and put his arm around me. And I'll never forget it. If you feel you must say something, speak from your heart. 
Don't try to say anything profound or theological or brilliant. And don't be afraid to say the person's name and to talk about them. The person's name is so, so important. Don't ignore it, which would imply the person never existed. This person lived and was in the, the grieving one's heart. So say their name and talk about them. Free, feel free also to tell the grieving person that you love them and that you're hurting for them. Now, if you feel you must do something, I suggest these. Give food or flowers. Send a note. A caring note is always, always so important and always so helpful. Donate to a charity in the deceased person's memory. And most importantly, take time to listen to their story without telling them your story. This is a time that it's about them. It's not about us. So I would suggest we be a very, very good listener. You know, grief is an emotion which we all understandably would rather not ever encounter. But I think if we live long enough, we probably will. I've talked about others who are experiencing grief and how we can relate to them, but what about the grief experience when it happens to us? First, I would suggest, if needed, seek counseling. Your pastoral care staff and your congregational care ministers here at Trinity are always available. And if you need, you feel, or if they feel you need professional help, we can certainly recommend several excellent professionals. Consider joining a support group. You know, sharing your story and listening to others' story can be very helpful. In fact, it can be healthy to go through the grief process. And don't think you have to rush recovery. It is not written anywhere that I know of that there is a certain time that we have to recover from grief. Finally, talk about your loved one. Talk about your memories of that person. It's healthy. Talk about them. I mentioned earlier the death of our little boy. When the doctors at Vanderbilt Hospital told us there was no hope for recovery, I went down to the hospital chapel. And as I sat there alone, and as I think most of us would have done, I begged and pleaded God to take my life in place of my son's. But of course, God doesn't take life. God gives life. And it was then that I began to feel God's presence. And I knew that God was not only grieving with me, God was grieving a million times greater than I because this beautiful child, like so many beautiful children around the world, he had lovingly created, and now that child of his would not be able to live a normal lifespan. It was also then that I began to feel God's comforting and strengthening presence almost flowing into me. And I began to understand these words about God's strength. God's strength is real. God gives us strength. And he gave me strength. Now please understand that the terrible pain of loss did not go away or even diminish. In fact, the pain was almost debilitating. And the pain continues even today. But the point I want to make is that because of God's quiet strength and understanding, I slowly gain the ability to cope with the pain. As Anne Lamott has said, God isn't there to take away our suffering or our pain, but to fill it with his or her presence. The Old Testament scripture that David read and that I selected describes King David's grief over the death of his son Absalom, when he cries out, Absalom, my son, my son, 
Absalom. This verse is considered by some biblical scholars to be the most poignant portrayal of human grief and desolation in all of Scripture. And yet we as Christians will never forget the words spoken from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? King David was devastated with grief, but he knew, just as our Lord Jesus knew, that the incredible power of God's love had always been there for him and always would be there for him. The love that never fails. The love that enabled King David to slowly get up, gather himself together, and to go forward to do his duty for the rest of his life. The same magnificent love that enabled Jesus not only to endure the cross, but to rise above as the living Christ for us all. I don't think King David ever forgot Absalom. I'm sure he continued to grieve and to carry Absalom in his heart. But with God's help, King David was able to go on with his life and responsibilities. And I think that had he lived a thousand years later, he would have understood the words of the Apostle Paul, the words that have sustained and empowered me and millions of others through the ages. And I ask you now to say these wonderful, historic, meaningful words with me. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you're struggling with grief, or you know someone who is grieving, try to remember these words when the darkness comes over you. And for the rest of us, let's remember that to love one another means to be there for each other during grief times as well as happy times. And when we hold each other close, the loving God is surrounding us with his love. And that is the love that never, never ends. Thanks be to God. Amen.
acolytes and ushers will come forward, we will receive our morning offering. Let us pray. Father, how do we pray to you rather than to reach out and grasp the love that you have for us, praying that as you engulf us in your ever-loving arms, that we truly know the sense of peace that you bring. We ask that you bless the offering that we receive today and that we use it to the best of your ministry through Trinity Church. In your name we pray. Amen.
You may be seated. Again, we welcome all visitors. We receive you with open arms. We want you, if you would like, to be a member of this fellowship. And if, if you would desire to do so, please see me after the service or any of the other staff members, and we will arrange for you to meet with Reverend Betsy, our senior pastor, who will return to the pulpit next week. coming up real soon, the Navy Band Sea Chanters, the United States Navy Official Chorus will be here on March the 19th. Tickets are available in the narthex as you exit this morning, so uh, feel free to stop by and pick up. This will be a, a ticketed event. There will be a No Stress Sunday for joining the church on February the 16th. If you are apprehensive about walking up here by yourself, there will be others joining the church on that day. We invite you to contact Reverend Betsy and join that other group at that time. This afternoon, let me remind you from 3 to 4.30, the uh, strategic planning meeting will be in Martin Hall this week. So we invite you to Martin Hall at 3 to 4.30 uh, for that event. Ben Richardson, our chair of the SPR committee, has asked me to bring a couple of announcements to you. That group has been very active. Um, Simon has announced that he is resigning uh, as of the 1st of March. We do have a new person who will be joining our uh, ministry team at that time. Uh, Gail Pfizer, and also there's a, an additional person joining our team for working with music and children and youth arts, Jonathan Merritt. He will be joining us next Sunday, and so we invite you to see, uh, be with him at that time. Simon's reception will be on February the 23rd, and then we'll have a welcoming reception on March the 2nd for our new staff members. Okay, thank you for being with us today. Would you stand and join as we sing our final hymn?
and now receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Come to our planning session at 3 o'clock, either in person or online today. And check out our website for uh, previous services or get the church app live on your smartphone or your tablet. Uh, we just got all kinds of ways to communicate the love of God to you. So for Christian and Matt and Mark, this is Steve. Have a wonderful day.